Today, we shall continue speaking about political institution of the United Kingdom. Political institution can be defined as an institutional arrangement for political governance or simply forms of government. Party systems can be two-party or multi-party, and the parties can be strong or weak depending on their level of internal cohesion. The political institutions are those bodies, parties, legislature, and the heads of state that make up the whole mechanism of modern government. In addition, political institutions include political party organizations, trade unions, and the legal courts. The term political institutions may also refer to the recognized structure of rules and principles within which the above organizations operate, including such concepts as the right to vote, responsible government, and accountability. Lecture 9 will be devoted to general elections and some other topics related to political institutions. So we shall speak about the party political system, parliamentary procedure, legislative proceedings, the government, the civil service and local government. Britain is divided for electoral purposes into constituencies or geographical areas of the country, usually containing about 60,000 voters, each of which returns one elected MP to the House of Commons. The constituencies are supposed to be frequently changed in size and location in order to ensure fair representation and to reflect population movements. General elections for parliamentary seats are by secret ballot, but voting is not compulsory. British, Commonwealth and the Irish Republic citizens may all vote in the elections provided they are resident in Britain, registered on the annual register of voters for the constituencies and are aged 18 or over and are not subject to any disqualification. People not entitled to vote include members of the House of Lords, certain mentally ill patients who are detained in hospital or prison, and persons who have been recently convicted of corrupt or illegal election practices. The candidate who wins the most votes in a constituency is elected MP for that area. This system is known as a simple majority or the first-past-the-post system. There is no voting by proportional representation except for local elections in Northern Ireland. The electoral system depends to a large extent upon the party political system, which has existed since the 17th century. Organized political parties present their policies in the form of manifestos to the electorate for consideration during the intensive few weeks of canvassing and campaigning before general election day. A party candidate in a constituency is elected to parliament on a combination of election manifesto, the personality of the candidate and the attraction of the national party. But party activity continues outside the election period itself as the politicians battle for power and the ears of the electorate. The great majority of the MPs in the House of Commons belong to either the Conservative or the Labour Party which are the largest political parties. This division emphasizes the continuation of the traditional two-party system in British politics, in which power has alternated between the two major parties. The Labour Party has traditionally gathered its support from the trade unions, the working class and some middle class backing. Its electoral strongholds have always been in South Wales, Scotland, in the Midlands and Northern England industrial cities. The Conservative Party has traditionally regarded itself as a national party, which appeals to people across the class barriers. The party's support comes mainly from business interests and the middle and upper classes, but a sizable percentage of skilled and unskilled workers and women have always voted Conservative. The party's strongholds tend to be in southern England, with scattered support elsewhere in the country, although it has serious setbacks in Scotland. Smaller political parties also have some representation in the House of Commons. 
Among these have been the Liberals and Social Democrats, the Scottish National Party, the Welsh National Party, the Protestant Northern Irish parties of the official Unionists, and some others. But a party which doesn't achieve a certain number of votes in the election loses its deposit the sum paid when a party registers to fight an election. Parliamentary procedure in both Houses of Parliament is mainly based on custom, convention and precedent. It's also contained in standing orders which govern details of procedure and which have been formulated over a long period of time. The Speaker is a Chief Officer of the House of Commons, is elected by the MPs and has full authority to interpret the rules and orders of the House. The Speaker is an elected MP who in elevation to the Speaker's chair ceases to be a political representative and becomes a neutral official. The parliamentary seat is not normally contested at a general election, although there have been exceptions to this convention. The Speaker protects the House against any abuse of procedure, may curtail debate in order that the matter can be voted on, has the power to adjourn the House to a later time, may suspend the sitting, controls the voting system, and announces the final result. In cases where there is a tie, the Speaker has the casting vote, but must exercise this choice in such a way that it reflects established conventions. The Speaker's position is very important to orderly running of the House. MPs can be very combative and often unruly, to an extent that the Speaker is sometimes forced to dismiss or suspend a member from the House. Debates in Parliament follow normal patterns. They are usually begun with a motion or proposal, which, if supported, is then debated by the whole House. The matter is eventually decided by a simple majority vote after a division, which is called at the end of the discussion. MPs enter either the yes or no lobby to record their vote but they may also abstain from voting. The proceedings of both Houses of Parliament are normally open to the public and may be viewed from the public and visitors' galleries. The transactions are published daily in Hansard, the parliamentary newspaper, which records most events and are also widely commented upon by the media. The proceedings of both Houses are now televised and radio transmissions may be broadcast live or at later time in recorded form. The courts may occasionally extend the common law by their decisions, but the creation of new law and fundamental changes to existing law are the responsibility of Parliament. This mainly means the implementation of the sitting government's policies. The government will usually issue certain documents before the actual parliamentary lawmaking process commences. The Green Paper is a consultative document which allows interested parties to state their case before a bill is introduced into parliament. A White Paper is not normally consultative in this wide sense, but is a preliminary document which itemizes the details of prospective governmental legislation. A bill will receive a formal first reading when it is introduced into the Commons by the government or a private member. After a variable period ranging from one day to several months, the bill is given its second reading after a debate on its general principles. The third reading of the bill considers it in its final form, usually on a purely formal basis. However, debate is still possible at this stage if demanded by at least six MPs. This delaying tactic may sometimes be used by the opposition parties to hold up the passage of a bill. After the third reading, a Commons bill will be sent to the House of Lords. It will then go through broadly the same stages again, except for those steps which are unique to the Commons. The Lords can delay a non-financial bill for two sessions, or roughly one year. It can also propose amendments, and if amended, the bill goes back to the Commons for further consideration. 
This amending function is an important power and has been frequently used in recent years, but the Lord's role today is to act as a forum for revision, rather than as a rival to the elected Mormons. In practice, the Lord's amendments can sometimes lead to the acceptance of changes by the government, or even a withdrawal of the bill. When the bill has eventually passed through the Lord's, it is sent to the monarch for the royal assent, which hasn't been refused since the 18th century. After the royal signature has been added, the bill becomes an act of parliament and is entered on the statute book as representing the law of the land at that time. The party which wins most parliamentary seats at a general election, or which has the support of a majority of MPs in the House of Commons, usually forms the new government. The British government normally consists of over 100 ministers and other officials chosen from both Houses of Parliament, who are appointed by the monarch on the advice of the Prime Minister. They belong to the party which forms the majority in the Commons and are collectively responsible for the administration of national affairs. The government can vary considerably in the number of ministers and departments set up by the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister, who is appointed by the monarch and is normally the leader of the majority party in the Commons, possesses a great deal of patronage in choosing ministers and deciding on the composition of the government. The Prime Minister's power stems from majority support in Parliament from the authority to choose and dismiss minister, from the leadership of the party in the country, and from a control over policy making. The Prime Minister usually sits in the Commons, as do most of the ministers, where they may all be questioned and are held accountable for government actions and decisions. The Prime Minister has historically been the connection between the monarch and parliamentary government. This convention continues today in the weekly audience with the monarch, at which the policies and business of the government are discussed. The Prime Minister consequently has great power within the British system of government, and there are arguments which suggest that the office has become like an all-powerful presidency, but there are considerable checks on his power, both inside and outside the party and parliament which makes the analogy less than accurate. However, it does seem that there is a greater emphasis upon prime ministerial government in Britain today, rather than the traditional constitutional notions of cabinet government. The cabinet is normally composed of up to 20 senior ministers from the government, who are chosen and presided over by the prime minister. Examples are the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Finance Minister, the Foreign Secretary, the Home Secretary, the Minister of Defense, the Secretary of State for Education and Science, and the Secretary of State for Trade and Industry. The cabinet structure originated historically in meetings that the monarch had with leading ministers in a small royal cabinet outside the framework of the Privy Council. As the monarch gradually ceased to play a part in active politics because of the growth of the parliamentary government and party politics, the royal cabinet developed more authority and independence and became a parliamentary body. Some countries, such as the USA and Canada, are federal. They are made up of a number of states, each of which has its own government with its own powers to make laws and collect taxes. In these countries, the central governments have powers only because the states have given them power. In Britain, it is the other way around. Local government authorities, generally known as councils, only have powers because the central government has given them powers. Several times in the 20th century, British governments have recognized local government abolishing some local councils and bringing new ones into existence. The system of local government is very similar to the system of national government. There are elected representatives called councillors. They meet in a council chamber in the town hall or 
county hall where they make policy which is implemented by local government officers. Most British people have far more direct dealings with local government than they do with national government. Local councils traditionally manage nearly all public services. Taken together, they employ three times as many people as the national government does. Local councils are allowed to collect one kind of tax. This is a tax based on property. All other kinds are collected by central government. It used to be called rates and was paid only by those who owned property. Its amount varied according to the size and location of the property. Most of the numerous services that a modern government provides are run at local level in Britain. These include public hygiene and environment health inspection, the collecting of rubbish from outside people's houses, and the cleaning and tidying of all public places. They also include the provision of public swimming pools, which judge admission fees, and public parks, which do not. The latter are mostly just green grassy spaces, but they often contain children's playgrounds and playing fields for sports such as football and cricket, which can be reserved in advance on payment. Public libraries are another well-known service. Anybody can go into one of these to consult the books, newspapers and magazines they are free of charge. If you want to borrow books and take them out of the library, you have to have a library card or ticket. The popularity of libraries in Britain is indicated by the fact that in a country without identity cards, a person's library card is the most common means of identification for someone who doesn't have a driving license. Counties are the oldest divisions of the country in England and Wales. Most of them existed before the Norman conquest. They are still used today by local government purposes, although a few have been invented this century, and others have no function in government but are still used for other purposes. Boroughs were originally towns that had grown large and important enough to be given their own government free of control by the country. These days, the name is used for local government purposes only in London, but many towns still proudly describe themselves as royal boroughs. Parishes were originally villages centered on a local church. They became a unit of local government in the 19th century. Today they are the smallest unit of local government in England. The name parish is still used in the organization of the main Christian churches in England. Here are some comprehension questions for you to discuss and to answer in written form. Thank you for your interest in country study and stay tuned to our YouTube channel.